Hey guys, what's up? So I'm going to follow up with my uh, little Ask Me Anything Q&A session, just, just for a laugh. I'm feeling a bit tired and a bit gassy. I sank an awful lot of ale last night. We were at, the, uh, at my 50th birthday party and uh, my wife and I were up till 2 o'clock in the morning, which for us is extreme. So anyway, I've, I've got a list of all the questions that you guys sent in in the like, first 24 hours, so I'm going to just whiz through those and we'll see what we get. Um, what is your favourite opening for white and black? Ha. Huh. Well, it's really hard to say. It really is. I mean, for me, as, um, as white, I think the Vienna is kind of my, my first love. You know, the Vienna Gambit is... It's kind of, that's what inspired the whole Freddy Krueger repertoire with black. So, you know, I, I, I do love playing that as black. And I'm loving the Charlick Gambit um, with, with the black pieces as well. So the Charlick Gambit, you an instant here. And when they take, you offer a second pawn and then come here and try and, uh, try and win their queen, basically. Um, if, you, if you don't know how it goes, then they, they quite often do this. You come out and do that, and then they'll do something. And you put your queen on e7, and they'll like put their bishop here, and then you castle, and then they castle. And then you take their knight out, and then you go bang with check, and a discovered attack on the queen. And that works quite well. Um, so yeah, I, I would have to say, you know, the, the, these are all good fun. And even when they don't accept it, you end up in some good fun games. Okay, do you play over the board games? And if so, what is your ELO rating? Um, I don't have a fee day. I've got an English Chess Federation. Let's just check up on that. Um, no, it's not been updated. 1665 provisional. That'll probably drop down because I lost my last game. Okay, and they, there you go. So uh, let's go back to the analysis board there. What's your favorite chess piece and why? This, this, this one comes up, but I love the knight. I, I, I'm a lover of the knight. Um, knight forks, royal forks, family forks. I think it's 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 a slow piece. It's a cumbersome one, but um, yeah, I, I, I and I, I find the the shape of the horse rather aesthetically pleasing as well. Next question: Beetles or stones? I was raised on the Beatles, guys. You know, I, I love the Stones. They've got some great, great tunes. Um, but you know, I know the whole Beatles uh, catalogue just off by heart. A uh, huge Beatles fan. All right, on to chess politics. Concerning the much discussed Neiman Nut Carlson cheating incident, what do you think actually happened? I don't know. Um, and then somebody else has asked, what are your thoughts on Magnus not playing in the World Championship? Well, look, I'll level with you guys. I don't find um, the top level of Super GM play or the politics very interesting at all. Sorry, you know. I know they try and make it as interesting as possible. I, I watched some of this world, this, this, um, this rapid play yesterday with, um, you know, Nakamura was playing and... and, and various others and it was like and they had Levy on there and they had Naroditsky on there and they were doing a great job at the commentary but it's just so drawish you know it's 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 just I mean look the top level of tennis is fantastic because you don't get a game where you know the server always just dominates and and, and wins um, you get you get beauty, you get real beauty, and you know sometimes in chess games you can get fantastic game. I know it just seems to be getting more and more rare. I don't know, you know. I, um, honestly, I like I like intermediate chess. I like this level of chess where you can have you can have a, a three point kind of material advantage or, 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 or um, eval advantage and still blow it, right? when there's something to fight for, you know? But these, you know, the so-called mistakes and blunders that the, the, the very top players make, it's just not that interesting. And, and I also don't like watching GMs playing very fast chess games and playing Blitz and Bullet either. It's just tedious to me. Um, I like, I like real-world chess, um, and that's, that's me. So, you know, regarding the cheating scandal or the alleged cheating scandal, I don't really care. I honestly just don't really care all that much. Um, you know, I think cheating stinks. 
and if if Neiman cheated, then he sucks, and if he didn't, then he didn't. So there you go. Next question: What's your history with chess? Been when did you first play it? Why has it remained a very prominent feature in your life? Well, it wasn't always a prominent feature in my life. Uh, my mum taught me to play chess on a a little board. I can picture the board now. It folded in half. It's like a box folded in half. Um, fairly normal pieces, quite light pieces, and it was a little bit slippery. So I used to like put it on her bed, and you know, used to play chess. And she always used to say that I used to exchange stuff far too willingly. Um, that was maybe when I was like six or seven, something like that. She taught me, and I played a little bit at school. Um, you know, the old like, lunchtime chess club at, at Westbourne School when I was, you know, eight nine. Uh, played a few games there. Didn't really play much at senior school or for most of my adult life. You know, just maybe very occasionally, but obviously on a real board. Um, I had a t- I had a little computer. I had a little tiny little chess computer the size of like a, a small calculator called Novag Solo when I was about 18 that I took on holiday to France and it had a fold out magnetic board with little round pieces that you could put and it just said what its moves were and you had to type in your move and uh, it was pretty good. It beat me consistently. Um, so yeah, I've forgotten about that one. Then I just picked it up about you know, three, four years ago um, why did I pick it up again? That's that's one of the next questions. You know, what what got you back into chess after a long hiatus since your childhood? I don't know. I mean, I've always I've always liked it, and, and I just thought, oh, you must be able to play chess online, right? Surely. So I just typed it in, play chess online, and chess.com comes up. I joined, got the bug, never looked back. That's it. What, um, okay. I recently purchased a Gotham chess course called D4 Dynamites. My question is, how would you study a Gotham chess course? I don't know. I own a couple. Um, They're okay. They are okay. Uh, How would I study it? I think I would probably rebuild the recommendations that Levy gives in a Lee chess study. Um, So, and then go over those. uh, But you do it with, so... Let me go to um, chess studies, like all my studies. I'll, I'll pick one out here. So if, you, if you're not familiar with this, so look, this is like the Janish Gambit study, okay? So you have multiple chapters, and for each chapter you can set it for what kind of analysis mode do you want. Now, interactive lesson is really, really cool. So here, if I go preview, okay? Okay, so I know this is the Janish Gambit. This is going to come from the Spanish. So we're going to have Bishop out to here. And then the Janish continues with this, okay? And it's saying, what would you play in this position? Um, Janish in D3, uh, let's say takes, okay? Now, and then you can add your own notes here and it will it will coach you. This is you coaching yourself through a game until you can remember it. Okay, develop normally, blah, 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 okay? And there we go, continue to develop eyeing the king, blah, okay? And it's these little hints that you can, you know, for me, that, that kind of works. So, yeah, that's what I would do. I would rebuild from Levy's videos. I'd rebuild it in into a Lee Chess study using that mode. So I'll remove the preview. And it's in the settings for each chapter, analysis mode, interactive lesson. That's the one that I like and find most useful. And quite honestly, yeah, I was talking a lot about Chessable uh, several months ago. But since I found these studies on Lee Chess, I think this is way better, way stronger than Chessable. So I, I honestly haven't opened Chessable since. You know, it's just it's just clunky compared to this. Lee Chess is great. Um, how do you recover from a tilt? I recently lost four hundred points from twelve forty-five to eight forty-five. Wow! And I really want to get back. Love your videos, by the way. Um, yeah, it's it's a tough one. Um, the first thing is don't chase losses. So if you are losing and if you're finding yourself frustrated and you think, I have to get that back quickly, you're acting like a a gambler on a losing streak, chasing losses. Stop it. Don't do that. Take a break. Walk away. Maybe just do puzzles for a day or two. Um, if, If your rating really matters to you, then try and get into a discipline of saying... Uh, I'm going to test to see if I'm performing well right now. So, do Puzzle Rush Survival. 
okay, and see if you can get close to your your record on Puzzle Rush Survival. So mine is like thirty nine. Um, can I get a thirty plus? Okay, in Puzzle Rush Survival. If not, maybe I haven't got the patience. Maybe I'm too tired. Whatever. Maybe I haven't slept properly, etc. Just don't you know. Um, or you could play against a particular bot. I like the Maya bots on uh, Leeches in particular, and just get a feel for how you're doing, or play a handful of Blitz games for fun, or play a game on Leeches if that's your soft play area, you know, and then if you feel like, actually, that, that went quite well, I'm up for this. Another really, really important thing is before you sit down to a game, test yourself. Say, am I willing to do whatever it takes to win this game? Am I willing to grind it out into an ending? Am I determined to look at the whole board and to be patient and to sit on my hands and to be sure in my own mind about the best move before I play it, or the best move I can find within my ability and experience before I play it? And if so, deep breath, play again. Right? Another option is to say it's only a bloody number. Enjoy the game and stop making life miserable for yourself. Yeah? I. I you know, if, if my rating dips down under 1500, I mean, I've been hovering around the 1500 to 1550 in Blitz and Rapid um, now for, for a good month. Right? If my rating goes under 1500 in Blitz, I don't care. I think to myself, well, I, I underperformed or my opponent was just playing really well. Yeah, it's a bloody game. Enjoy it. All right? it's, it's not that serious. What are your medium to long term chess goals? I would like to hit 2,000 at Rapid on chess.com, basically. Uh, that would be great. Um, that's as far as I can see it, really. I mean, there's part of me would love to create a, a course of my own, and it would absolutely not be anything to do with openings. It would be to do with tactical patterns, and uh, specifically aimed at, at the beginner and improving player. But that's... That's a kind of long-term goal, but there's an awful lot of work to be done in that. I, I do have a massive collection of um, real-world tactics that I've been building up probably for about three years now from my own games, which I think is really, really fascinating. Um, yeah, that's something that I might do it someday in the future. How do you stay motivated? Um, just, well, I mean, part of it's good interaction in the comments from my followers. Um, I just, well, the thing is with chess, it, you almost don't need to ask that question because it's so varied and it's so rich. And every game, well, almost every game is different. I've had the same game a few times, obviously, because I like the odd trick. Um, no, I, I find the game just rich enough and, and involving enough that motivation isn't really an issue. I, 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 if, if I'm tired and not feeling up to it, then some days I just don't play. And that's important, you know. You, you don't want to fall out of love with it, you know. If if you if you if you, you haven't got your chest head on, do something else. Yeah, go for a walk, forage some mushrooms. You know, whatever you want to do, um, play a musical instrument, whatever. You know. Um, yes. So the same kind of thing. When I lose a game of chess, or I'm in the throes of a major losing streak, it's a serious blow to my ego. How do you cope with losses? Um, I think I've just pretty much said that, you know, if, if you sucked, then take the lesson from the game. What did I, where did I screw up in the game, right? Analyze the game yourself, uh, ideally before you analyze it with an engine or instead of, um, if your opponent played really well, then think I was outplayed on the day, right? Um, don't take it as a blow to you. Your chess rating is not you, right? It's a measure of... Two things, right? Your overall ability and your current performance. And that's it, right? If you, you, if you lose, like, like the previous question, you know, said I, I lost 300 points, you didn't get 300 points worse. It's just that you're, you're on a performance slide. Now, if you're capable of being a 1200, you, you will get back to 1200. Don't worry about it. Don't sweat it. Enjoy the ride. You know, we're, we're only here once, whatever. Enjoy it. Ah, okay. Um, if you could collaborate with any other chess streamer, who would you choose? Very good question. 
well, I love working with you know the, the chess boot camp coaches. Um, you know, James obviously is, has his own channel as well. Um, I mean, you know, if I got the chance, would I like to collaborate with Naroditsky or you know Levy Rosman or, or whatever? I don't know. I don't know. I, I'd love to do something with Simon Williams one day. Though I, yeah, I've got a, Simon was like the first chess YouTuber that I really followed. And uh, I like his sense of humour and I like his, his chess style as well very much. So I think probably the ginger cheer, I'd have to say. Yeah, I think I'd enjoy that. I think, you know, I'd like to go down the pub with him and, and uh, chew the fat a little bit. And, uh, you know, do a bit of Harry fan club stuff. What are you going to do to stimulate growth and find ways to implement new and original content? Uh, same answer, I'm afraid, guys. It's a bit boring, but... Chess is that rich and that interesting that the new and original content just keeps coming. So, you know, until it runs out, you're stuck with me. Have you considered a video on the four nights opening for both colours? No. Um, I just haven't, you know. There are, there's so much material out there about openings. Um, I don't think that it's really my it's a, a place where I can add much to to what's out there. I think um, a lot of beginners and improvers stress far too much about openings. And they're really not that important. You're much better off improving your game vision, your board vision, your tactical awareness, and, and learn learn the, the holes in your own game. In the middle game, in the ending, the opening really, you know, principles are far, far more important than, than learning opening so that's my thing okay very simple one here how does ben derive meaning in life religion philosophy well that's a big one um not religion not these days i, I used to be more religious when i when i was younger uh meaning in life i i i'm a big believer in natural law and the way that the universe is, is set up to work with, which I think is awesome and rich and vibrant. And I love the way that life kind of changes to adapt to every environmental niche that's out there. And life is really all about the, the, the flow of nutrients and energy, okay, and, and water and everything. Um, but it's set up in such a way that, that this self-perpetuating life thing, um, it's it's a it's just complete beautifully cyclical and it just goes round and round and round and we should um, in my view occupy our role our place in the web of life in such a way that that honors other life right um, I've actually I've, I've actually written a book called The Red Pill Food Revolution that's coming out at the beginning of 2023, which, which you know, really helped me to, to solidify some of these ideas. Um, but yeah, I think humans, with our big old brains, we've very much perverted and tried to improve on nature. And you don't get to do that. It doesn't work. Nature is perfect. It's divinely ordained. Um, and the system that we've created is very poor. And it's not based on the beautiful cycle of life. It's based on the pyramid. Um, and it's about harvesting resources and for some people trying to get as much for themselves as possible. And I think that's a bit crap. And it doesn't work. And it's self-destructive and suicidal and psychopathic as well. So there you go. Nice uh, light answer to that one. What's my advice to deal with inevitable tragedies in life? Uh, kind of similar to... The chess thing, I suppose, you know, it happens. It does happen. Um, I don't know. You've got to go through, you know, re go into your feelings. You know, tragedies happen. Embrace it. Go through it. Go through grief, whatever. Stress, come out the other side. But and also, I think a very big part of, of what I'm about is is uh, tapping into your real power. I think the human beings are a lot more powerful than we have been allowed to, um, to know. But uh, enough about that right now because I'm working on something else for the beginning of next year as well. 
uh, which could be to do with all of that. So I'm very much involved in um, uh, like alternative views on health, alternative views on, well, you know, non-orthodox views on, on food in particular, because I've just written a book about that. But what, what we're told to eat is not fit for human consumption. Most of what is sold as food is food-like products out there that just make you sick and obese and not good at all. But um, I could talk about food forever. I'm not going to. I've got more questions to get through. Um, my question is, based on you being an old man and such, mm -hmm, what are any valuable life lessons you've learned over the years that you'd like to share with your viewers? Um, don't automatically trust authority. Yeah, they're lying to you. Uh, watch, watch as much George Carlin as you can. Right, George Carlin, sadly not with us anymore, but um, yeah, so his later work in particular, my God, you know the guy, the guy's amazing. There are there are lots of ways of, of looking at the world. The way that you have been taught to look at the world from your earliest education all the way through, and being told that you must trust authority and you must obey, ain't necessarily so. But I'll leave it there, and you can figure out the rest for yourself. Um, if you wish to. Look up the Red Pill Revolution book, uh, which is the first book in the series that, that I wrote with four other co-authors. But I did the, I'm I'm, I'm the pen man. I did I did the actual writing. Uh, very very interesting book. It's not like a, a a mad tinfoil hat conspiracy theory book, but it's a kind of a bridge to to that world. Doesn't go down um, all the rabbit holes, but it's for people who are looking at the world and going. Um, I there's something not quite right about the way that all this is set up. But anyway, yeah, theredpillrevolution.com. Go ahead, buy a book. It would support me. Appreciate it. Great Christmas gift. When will we, we meet Mrs. Hunty? Well, Mrs. Hunty is, doesn't go on the camera very often, but I'll, I'll show you um, School of... There we go. Artisan Summer School... Uh, she should be on here somewhere. Our teachers. There we go. Uh, she's a um, she's a tutor at the School of Arts and Food in which is in North Nottinghamshire, basically smack in the middle of England. There she is, Sally Ann Hunt. Uh, she's a wonderful cook and a wonderful human being, as well. Um, you can find out a little bit more about her and the courses that she does. And she's a specialist in the meat side of things, uh, sausages pies, barbecuing, uh, smoking and curing, all of that good stuff. Yeah, wonderful school. If you want to learn about food, go along there. All right. Um, what's my day job? Oh, very good question. I don't really have one. I'm technically a bit unemployed at the moment. I, I was, um, I, I started out as a web designer in 1994, which was pretty much, you know, at the beginning of when web design began, um, to, to put it into, into context, my first web browser that I used was the Mosaic browser, which is, so we're talking pre-Netscape, pre-Internet Explorer, obviously. Uh, so I, I was in that from the beginning. I've done, I've had my own agencies in the past, um, and I've just had like a six year long contract stroke relationship with one particular client. Um, that I did some some coding work and prototyping and marketing and stuff like that. That came to a natural end because they were ready to grow to the next level, uh, and they needed people who were more local because they're based in the US. So, but I'm also involved with a group called the Human Unleashed. So if you want to go along, you can check out the Human Unleashed.com, um, and that's about. So there you go. It's advertising the Red Pill Revolution there, and it, you know biohacking. But also, you know, finding ways to, to deal with modern life that are distinctly non-conventional and unapproved by the, uh, the mainstream orthodoxy, for sure. Um, but yeah, I, I work with a really, really great bunch of guys on there. Uh, you can check that out for yourself if, if you want. And then we've got, um, yeah, so stuff about the Red Pill Revolution. And, and we've, we've got a group on there as well that we do Q&A sessions and stuff like that uh, every couple of weeks, all to do with approaches to health, taking back control of your own life, taking back uh, control over your, 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 your own power, your own health and stuff like that. Um, 
so that's kind of it. I, I mean, I, I've, I've got I've got a few other things. I I've got like in the summer months. Um, I'm now going to be teaching uh, bushcraft as well. So I'm really, really. I've always been fascinated in uh, anything kind of ancestral and tribal and stuff. So yeah, do a lot of bushcraft stuff. I've done a lot this summer. I've done some done some weekends and and whatever. Um, that's just just a load of fun. Uh, that's all good. And also, it, obviously, in my spare time, um, I have made a lot of didgeridoos, and I tend to do that in the summer as well. Because I, you know, from being a kid, I've always been one of these people that I just, when the summer's out, I wanted to be outside. You know, I didn't want to be stuck in front of a, a computer. Um, so yeah, made a lot of uh, bunch of didgeridoos. Some of these are still on sale. Some of these I have sold or given away to other people. That's me with very long hair. Um, but I didn't have it cut all the way through the lockdown, so it turned to straw and had to go. Uh, but yeah, that's it, barefoot didgeridoos as well. All good fun. And you know, one thing I really love is the process of deciding I'm gonna do, make a ditch today, right? So I'll, I'll take a folding saw, I'll take my dogs, I'll go out into the woods, usually barefoot, um, I'll find a branch and go, that might, that might be good. You know, I'll cut it, carry it back, shape it, split it, carve it out, glue it back together, because that's how we have to do it in this country, because we don't have termites and eucalyptus trees. Um, we, like the, you know, the, the, the traditional proper um, digits that you get from Australia. Uh, but yeah, I love this, this, this thing where you go from the whole concept and you are involved throughout the entire process in a very mindful way, and then you even get to enjoy the product at the end of the day. I mean, you know, I've got some some really awesome didgeridoos that I've made that way. And it's, it's, it's deeply satisfying. And a lot, a lot of us in our daily jobs now, we go, um, like your job is to turn up here, you know, you, you've got to attach widget B to widget C and all day long and wait for the, the hooter to go and you can go home and you're tired and you're exhausted and you want to anesthetize yourself with alcohol and, you know, TV and all this kind of nonsense. And you're supposed to do that for, half a century of your life, you're basically giving away your life force, your, your vital energy to an employer in the hope that you'll have some pension that's still there when you go to collect it and that you can enjoy a few years actually relaxing and being outside and gardening or playing golf or sailing or whatever you want to do. Um, I don't think that doesn't really make sense to me. When the sun's out, I want to be outside enjoying the sunshine. Pretty simple. Right, what is next? How many languages do you speak? Um, English, I speak French pretty fluently. A uh, little bit of German, Italian, and Spanish. That's it. Also, what's your favorite gambit to play? Well, now, um, I, I kind of have to go back to the Vienna gambit because it's like the, it's the daddy of the Freddy Krueger repertoire. Yeah, you know, with the Russo and the Janish and all that kind of stuff, but the you know the von Hennig gambit against the Karakhan is just evil. Um, I love playing Danish gambit for a long time, but yeah, the um, yeah the Vienna gambit is is probably you know it's it's like my first love. Yeah, I've never seen you play the London system or Collie system. What's your position on these? I used to play the London system a lot. I have probably got a bunch of games. On the London system, um, yeah, I can play these openings a bit more. I've never really studied studied the collie. You know, the, the collie. Um, there we go. Bring back a analysis board. Um, so the collie system has has a, a similar kind of you know setup, but in in the collie you play the C three move before. You develop, you bring out the, the bishop. In the London, you normally bring this bishop out to f4. And in the collie, you push e3 first. Uh, it, it's very good as well. You know, it's highly thought of. and A lot less popular than the London. Um, could be great. I don't know. So what's my position on them? Basically, don't get hung up on bloody openings, right? You know, pick, pick something that you enjoy, that gives you the kind of games that you like, and enjoy playing those, right? That's it. Uh, I'm 77. Uh, I'm not. I'm 50 now. 
Uh, I've played rugby for 20 years, awesome, until got banged up shoulder. What's your role with rugby? Well, I got injured aged 16, playing a very high level schools rugby, top level schools rugby, uh, in the front row, got my back, I got bent over, um, and my back got seriously put out. Uh, actually, my bottom vertebrae, my very bottom vertebrae, my L1, it was about half an inch too far forward. Uh, it cost me the whole rest of the year, no sport for the rest of the year. Um, my rugby career from that point then consisted of sitting on the couch, drinking beer, and watching the the internationals, like the Five Nations, Six Nations, um, and I did that for 30 years, aged 46. I thought, do you know what? I mean, I'm still a you know relatively strong, fit guy. I, I fancy having a run out. Let's have a go. Let's have a go at rugby. So I went down to my local club, Mosbra RUFC, okay, Mosbra, and uh, I did one season. I bulked up. I went down the gym a lot. Got up to 100 kilos, 17 stone. What's that in pounds? I don't know. Uh, it's uh, 210, 205, 210 pounds. Um, but it, it really, really hurt my back. And all, doing all the squats and the deadlifts and stuff like that to, you know, to build up all that strength. Um, now my back just wasn't ready. But since then I've been working on my diet. I've had osteopathy and stuff. My back is now pretty much right, pretty much perfect. Um, so I, I could do it, but I, I did one season at that and then I thought, you know, I can't keep playing. I'm, I'm waking up on a Wednesday, I'm still aching, you know, from a Saturday afternoon game. Uh, I thought, bollocks to that, bugger it, right in the ear. And uh, then the club put me through my refereeing course, and I'm a referee. And I go out, I'll do kids, you know, I'll do university games, I'll do adult games and stuff like that. It's just great, great fun. Love it. Um, you always throw in a lot of movie quotes, so what are your top three films? Oh, Lord. Oh, my Lord. Well, Lord of the Rings... If I can take the whole series as put those in as one, that's got to be one. I'm a huge fan of uh, I mean, what I've watched recently, Shaun of the Dead. I've watched this, uh, The Big Lebowski, obviously, is right up there. Um, Idiocracy, great film. Uh, I love the new Dune movie that was out just over a year ago. Really, really like that. Uh, Princess Bride, classic, absolute classic. You know, I, I love a lot of films. V for Vendetta. You know, I, I've got a real soft spot for that one as well. So, yeah, probably, you know, take your pick out of those, really. Um, and, you know, I like some of the more recent Star Wars films. Not episodes one and two at all. Or really three. Um, but, yeah, some, some of the more recent Star Wars ones have been, been lots of fun as well. Uh, so that's it. Someone says, I've realised there's a trend of all sorts of animals. Being around your home, what's that about? Well, it's that we've got lots of animals and um, some of them go around and get pregnant without our knowledge. So we got my birthday last year. Uh, my wife got me two kittens, a boy and a girl, uh, black and white. And um, then in the same week, literally two days later, another kitten literally just turned up in our garden. And so we, in, we brought her into the house and fed her and she lives here now. Uh, she's a little bit older, about a month older than the other two. And then this spring, they both got knocked up. Um, both the girls got knocked up. We didn't know that they could get pregnant, you know, being only, like four months old. Um, we'd never had female cats before. Um, so now we know. And one of them had four babies and the, the other one had six. Um, the six will hopefully be finding new homes quite soon. But we keep, we've got a, a quite a large garden, there's two acres of, of garden here, and we've always kept ducks and chickens since we moved in. Um, so that, that's all good fun. Uh, but it means that we have to, you know, go out in the morning, let them out, and then put them away in the evening and stuff like that. But we get great fresh eggs and stuff. It's, it's uh, very rewarding. So that's it. We have lots of animals and six dogs. And a partridge in a pear tree. All right, there's a guitar behind you. Yes, two guitars. Um, how deep are you in playing guitar? What's your favorite genre? Not only guitar, also in general. Okay, um, somebody else has asked, how, how, long are you, how long have you been playing? How good are you? I started when I was 29. Because uh, any time I'd be anywhere and somebody would pick up a guitar and throw out a song, I'd go, oh, that's so cool. I wish I could do that. And then when I was 29, I was around at a mate's house um, 
you know, drank drank some wine. He pulled out a guitar. He had a lovely voice, Mick, Mick from the from Northeast. Lovely voice. He just he just did like a dozen folk songs. Um, and then I, I thought to myself, fuck it. I thought, fuck it. I'm going to go out and buy buy a guitar and a book with chords in it, and I'm going to teach myself. So I I improved very rapidly for the first six months, and I've kind of flatlined for the next twenty years. Yeah, that's pretty much it. But I I enjoy it. That's the point. You know, I'm not the best in the world. Like chess, don't care. You know, I like to, but sometimes all I want to do is just pick up the guitar and throw out a song. So, what genres do I like? I, I like a bit of kind of indie rock, but mainly like folk, folk rock, Levelers. Um, you know, some songs by like Oasis, Chili Peppers, stuff like that, and yeah, some a few more classic folk songs. I mean, my 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 ideal night out is to rock up at a pub where there's a singer's night on, which means anyone can just start a song. You know, so you sit around, there's a great pub in the Peak District called the Three Stags Heads. You know, some of the best nights of my life have been in there, you know, and they say, yeah, chuck it here, and the you know, guitar comes around, or someone's got a fiddle and whatever. It's just great. I, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan, as you can probably tell, of us making our own whatever. We, we should be self-sufficient. We get huge enjoyment from being self-sufficient, and uh, that very much applies to entertainment as well. So there's nothing like live music. It's great. Um, when and why did you fall in love with the didgeridoo? Uh, Glastonbury Festival 1992. It's the only time I've been. And already by that time, it was so massive, it was overwhelming. I mean, it's incredibly expensive to go now. It's all full of middle-class woke kids. Um, I went along there. And there were, at any point in like the four days or whatever that it's on, there were many different things that I wanted to do. So I was just completely overwhelmed and ended up just sitting in the green fields, getting stoned and uh, with, with the hippies. And I walked past the stand and this bloke was selling bamboo didgeridoos and I thought that will do me. Bought one off him and taught myself to play. And that was it. Um, there we go. What else? Could you do a video of what your streaming setup looks like for those who may want to start? Possibly, yeah, but we won't go into that now. Um, besides playing, what things are you doing to improve at chess? Do you do chess puzzles? Yes. Read books? I own books. I don't know if that's the same thing. Um, watch videos, yeah. I love watching videos. I love watching Naroditsky in particular. Like while I have my breakfast, I'll you know, see if uh, Dania has posted a game. Like his speed runs are really, really good. For, for my level um, so that's it yeah anything you would recommend books wise there are some great books out there but I mean it's, that's a big big old topic and it really depends on your level and depends what you like so um, I just look around you know try a few things go on eBay as well you know get get them second hand you know buy a used one and, and give it a go uh, what do you think is the most effective way for someone to improve at your level asking as a fellow 1500 well look, if I knew that I'd be a 1600 wouldn't I um, effective way to improve play when you're playing well and don't play when you're not playing well um, focus a lot more on end games and tactics not on openings uh, play long time controls and also maybe play over the board as well you know I'm getting a, a chestnut board soon so we'll talk about that um, yeah, you know, really work at it. You know, you have to work at it. If you, if all you do is just play, 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 you'll be repeating the same patterns over and over again. You have to find where is the edge of your ability and focus on that. Um, and I would also say, obviously, chess bootcamp live. If you want to play in a social setting, it's really, really enjoyable. But also, you know, join the local club if you can. All right, got a series of five questions here. When at what age did you learn to play chess? We've done that one. What's your all-time favourite opening? Probably Vienna. We've talked about that. How many kittens and cats do you have? Well, currently we've got one, two, three, four adults and six babies, so ten right now. What's your favourite food? <sighs> favourite food. Oh, blimey. Now, if I had to eat, like, I love my bacon and eggs. Love my bacon and eggs, I have to say, because we make our own bacon as well so you know so I I think bacon and eggs on toast 
right? So literally my breakfast is probably three good rashers of bacon um, fried in lard or tallow, which we make also make ourselves a lot of the time. Uh, so I use about an ounce of homemade animal fat. Sourdough bread with a, probably another ounce of salted butter on that and maybe three, sometimes four of our free range chicken or duck eggs from home. Sounds like a lot of animal fat that we are told is gonna clog your arteries and give you heart disease. It's not true. Don't believe a word of it. Um, it's literally your body's preferred way of storing energy. It's like your body creates animal fat and then consumes it later on. So how on earth can putting it in your mouth, then it goes in your bloodstream, kill you, it can't, it fails the most basic test, but anyway. Yeah, animal fat is the key to um, health in many, many ways, but you'll have to read the book to find out more about that. Uh, so, bacon and eggs in the morning, steak and chips, mate, good ribeye, really good ribeye steak or, or beef rib of any kind. Yeah, again, plenty of fat. Um, you know, we, we, do, we do our own fries, again, fried in tallow, really, really gorgeous. Ah, question five, do you dare to try out the Mason Kerry's, Mason Kerry's variation in the King's Gambit? I don't know what it is, <coughs> but I might have to look into it. Okay, last few. Um, I've been thinking of joining my local chess club because I need a new hobby after my band split up, sorry to hear that. I've been playing a lot of chess recently. My worry is everyone's going to be so much better than me, I'm 1100. And I'm slightly confused about what you actually do at chess club, where you rock up and you play chess um, against the other people who turn up, and it's casual. Uh, or you may join a team and you may play matches, which is a lot of fun. And I tell you what, you will learn a lot from your matches because you put so much effort into those games. You will remember those games. I mean, I can remember the game. I, I couldn't tell you the last Blitz game I played on chess.com, but I can remember all of those over the board games that I've played. I've played like five or six now, right? Um, what do you do at chess club? Yeah, you, is it mostly just playing games? Well, I mean, every chess club is different. I don't know, you know. All you can do, mate, is just turn up. Turn up, have a feel for it. If you enjoy it, do it again. If you don't, stop it, it's not that hard. Other lectures or other activities, don't know. Um, and is it all ages? Yeah, well, my chess club tends to be, it's all men and ranging from the 30s upwards, really. Um, some quite old ones, so that's it. Okay. okay, and finally, four questions from Jules. Do you like the horse or the castle? The horse, you know, they're both great. Question two, do you think the bishop looks like a winkle? Yes. Given your marketing background, how would you promote an over-the-board chess club in a small English town around 40,000 people? Great question. Um, I'd probably try and get kids involved. You know, it wouldn't be a bad thing. Maybe, you know, go through school, go through churches. Um, obviously, any, like, local Facebook groups. A lot of towns have their own Facebook groups. Um, I don't know. Maybe some kind of launch event. Like a, you know, could you run a, could you run a tournament? Could you borrow um, the, some boards and some clocks and, and, and just do it for fun? I don't know. Uh, it's a very good question, but again, we could probably spend a whole video on that one. And how would you promote junior chess in your county to encourage schools to restart clubs and book more youngsters take up the game? Um, Jules, again, very big question. It's, I mean, I'm not really in the, you know, promotion, promotion of chess club field. That's more an issue for the English Chess Federation or, or FIDE or whatever, you know, your, your local federation, whatever that may be. So yeah, don't really know. But anyway, great bunch of questions. I hope my responses have not been boring. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for submitting them. Um, thanks for watching. If you stay till the end, you rock and see you soon.